This is the final, um, fourth and final lecture in the gases unit. It's going to cover kinetic energy, average velocity. So you would have learned about that on the gizmo with the Maxwell-Boltzmann uh, graphs. And it's going to cover rates of effusion and rates of diffusion um, based on the average molecular speed and kinetic energy, et cetera. And it's going to cover real gases versus ideal gases. So some ways that gases might not behave the way we've said they've behaved in this whole unit. So this is kind of a, a mishmash of the end of the unit. You're going to do the same thing you've done. That would be um, pause the video here. This list is um, meant to be mostly definitions and the simple relationships, so you don't need a lot of information, um, but leave some space because we will do some examples and I'll talk about some of this as I come back to the video. So pause the video here when you're finished setting up your framework, then you can start the video again. Now that you have the introduction, let's go ahead. So the first thing I want to talk about is root mean square speed of particles, and this can be um, referred to as the average velocity. This could be referred to as the speed of the particles, etc. But truly, when we calculate root mean square speed of the particles, we're saying that it is the um, speed of the particles, and because it's a square root relationship with temperature and molar mass, we call it the root mean square speed. So this is abbreviated U sub RMS. Often you'll just see it U. Sometimes you see it um, as just velocity, but you definitely want to be aware of the formula. So what you're looking at here is that this gives us a relationship between the particle speed in gases, the gas particles themselves, how fast they move, and um, a few things that affect how fast they move. So this formula is um, two constants, the number three and R are both constants, and so they are the same for every single gas in every single condition. But then there are also two variables that can change that will affect the average speed of gas particles. And so um, the first one that we want to look at is temperature. You should um, see here that temperature is in, in the numerator, which means that it's a direct relationship with the average speed, even though that's a square root, so it's not linear. It's actually um, kind of an exponential type relationship. We would have to um, change the Kelvin temperature by a factor of four, and then that would be the square root of that, um, to make the speed of the particles double, okay? So you have to picture that because of that square root, um, if I want to make this times two, then I have to make this times four because then I can square root four and get two, okay? Um, so it is direct, but it's definitely not linear. And then you'll see the other variable that we want to look at tonight, and that would be the molar mass. Notice that molar mass is inversely related to the average speed of particles. And again, it's that square root and inverse relationship. So if I want um, two different gases, one to be twice as fast, its molar mass has to be one-fourth of, now we're putting the four in the denominator, right? It would have to be one-fourth of the um, molar mass of the other gas. So this is how this works. Um, seldom will you be asked to actually calculate the root mean square speed. Um, I do want you to see that if they ask you to calculate it, you would need this R with these really strange units. And the derivation of this comes from joules, which is um, comes in kinetic energy. You'll see joules. This is not the units you're used to in your R, but this is the thermodynamics R. So when we do the thermodynamics unit later, um, we'll come into this and talk about that. But what happens is that we can replace joules with all of this, kilograms times meter squared per second squared. And when we do that, we get these weird units, kilograms times meter squared over moles Kelvin second squared. But if I put all of that into R in this equation, then um, the molar mass has to be in kilograms, notice, um, because I need the kilograms to cancel, and that would be molar mass would be in kilograms per mole, so those would cancel. And the temperature would be in kelvins, so 
those would cancel, and that would leave us with meters squared over seconds squared, which when we take the square root would give us meters per second, which would be the units on average velocity, or root mean square speed. So you have to be really careful. You're not used to working with molecular mass in kilograms per mole. It's not going to matter unless you're asked to calculate the root mean square speed of one gas. Um, most of the time we do comparisons, so we don't actually ever have to use the R, just like before when we did this, we didn't have to use the R if we were comparing two situations. So you'll see how this works in a second, but this is the formula that gives us that relationship. So what you want to take away from this is two things, that temperature is directly related, not linearly, but directly related to average speed of particles, and molar mass is inversely related. The heavier the particle, the slower they move. Okay, so now um, I already mentioned a little bit of this, but let's do some practice that shows you how this works. So remember that average particle speed is directly related to Kelvin temperature, and um, it's not linear. So we can do this with the same gas at different temperatures. And basically the way this ends up looking is U at temperature 1 and U at temperature 2. And if we wanted to derive this formula, I'll show it to you just once so you can kind of see what this means. It would be 3RT1 over molar mass 1 all over 3RT2 over molar mass 2, right? But if we have the same gas, then the molar mass is constant, and 3 and R are constants that we'll cal calculate separately, or we'll cancel out as we calculate. So what this really gives us is U at T, whoops, sorry, U at T1 over U at T2 equals the square root of T1 over T2. Like everything else that we do, those temperatures have to be in Kelvin because the Kelvin temperature is what's the format and what's the foundation of kinetic molecular theory. So we're talking about kinetic energy here and this is really important. So let's see how this works. We'll do this example. I'll get rid of my derivation here so that we can I can write that example there. Gas X is maintained at 27 degrees Celsius. The first thing I'm gonna do is add 273 to make that 300 Kelvin. And I want to know, if I want to make the velocity four times faster than that of what it is at 27, what temperature does it have to be? So I'm going to set this up with my um, four times um, would be what I want. So my initial here, this would be the velocity at uh, 27 degrees Celsius or 273. And I want it to be four times faster. So the ratio would be four to one. Okay, and then I'm going to set up the square root, and the first temperature that goes, notice that these go together, numerator, numerator, and denominator, denominator, so I'm going to put my um, temperature at my slower temperature, my lower temperature that goes with the 4 to 1, the 1 part would be under here, and so that's going to be 300 Kelvin in the denominator, and I'm going to be solving for this temperature up here. So if I solve for this, it will give me the temperature at which the speed, the average velocity is four times faster than it is at 27. So when I do the math, the easiest way to do this, of course, I think mathematically would be to square this, and then you have to square this, and that will clear the square root. So what we end up with is 16 over 1 equals T over 300 Kelvin, because by squaring the square root, I got rid of the square root, but when I square the other side, I actually have to square the numbers. So now you can see that T would be 16 times 300 Kelvin, so T would be um, 4,800 Kelvin, because 16 times 3 is 48, so 4,800 Kelvin, and I want the temperature in Celsius, so I have to come back and subtract 273. It seems kind of silly. So the temperature at which the gas would move, the same gas would move four times faster, is 4,527 degrees Celsius. That's un unfathomable. We probably would not ever be able to create that. So this kind of gives you an idea of how this um, relationship, because of the square root, is definitely directly proportional average velocity with temperature in kelvins, but it's not linear, right? Um, we, we definitely are going to do way more than four times the temperature. Okay, so let's look at a different example, and before we do that, I want to talk about diffusion and effusion. You should have this in your notes already, that diffusion is spreading out. Basically, it's a gas that um, the particles are going from where there's more, 
from an area with more concentration or more gas particles to an area with less gas or less particles, fewer particles. And effusion is just like diffusion, except that it has to be leaking out of a hole in a container. So it's a fusion that occurs when your helium balloon that you get at a party um, loses its helium and no longer floats. That's effusion. The helium particles are very small and can sneak through the pores in the balloon. It's effusion if you have a pinhole leak in a container and the gases will be leaving the container. So diffusion would just be in a big open space here going from here to spreading out. And effusion would be the particles are all in here and they're going to come out through this pinhole leak. Okay, so that's the difference between them. Graham's law is a law that we can use to discuss two different gases. So we're going to worry about molar mass. Graham credit was credited with discovering this relationship between the molar mass of the gases and the average speed. Um, technically, it's Graham's law of effusion, but we can use it for diffusion also. And most of the time, you'll be calculating the ratio between the two, just like we did up here where we're saying the temperature needs to be four times greater. You'll be finding out how many times faster the lighter gas moves. Okay, so um, remember that average particle speed is inversely related to molar mass, and we could go back and derive that again the same way I did up here before I erased it, um, but Graham's law is it already derived. So this would be U of gas A over U of gas B. This is two different gases now. It's not the same gas at different temperatures. It's two different gases. And because it's inversely proportional, we have to put the molar mass of B, which is in the denominator of the ratio of the velocities or the effusion rate, has to go in the numerator under the square root and the molar mass of A. So we have to flip that under the square root. The heavier the gas, the slower it moves. Um, the lighter the gas, the faster it moves. And so we have to flip that relationship. Um, so now let's just kind of see what is the ratio of effusion rates for the lightest gas and the heaviest known gas, which is uranium hexafluoride, or UF6. So um, when we look at this, I really like to put the faster gas on top in the ratio of the rates. Um, so I want to do the um, rate of effusion, we can call it R for hydrogen, over the rate of effusion for UF6, like this, so that what I find will be some numerical relationship where hydrogen is so many times faster than UF6 is. Um, it's kind of confusing if you end up with a decimal because then what you're really saying is that your light, your heavier one is that fraction of the speed and it's just kind of confusing. So I like to put the faster one or the lighter one on top in the ratio of the rates, which means that it's gonna to have to go on the bottom inside the square root, okay? So this will be the molar mass of UF6 over the molar mass of H2. And when I go ahead to substitute in, I'm just going to use the periodic table. And UF6, I used a molar mass of 352 grams per mole. And for hydrogen, I used 2.02 .02 grams per mole. And I do the division and take the square root. And I discover that the answer to that is 13.2, which means that really hydrogen is 13.2 to 1 as fast or faster than UF6. So for every um, increment of time, hydrogen will travel 13.2 times farther um, in the same increment of time, or that's kind of the way that you can look at that. Okay, so that's how you solve those. Um, and I want to do one more with time so that you can see what's happening with that. Here's the weird thing, is the faster you are, the less time it takes. Okay, so time is... Um, directly related to molar mass because it's inversely related to average velocity. I should have reversed those two bullets. So picture that if you are traveling down the highway um, at 70 miles an hour, I hope you're not, but if you are at 70 miles an hour or you're walking in your neighborhood at um, maybe three miles an hour, then it's going to take you a lot less time on the highway to go one mile, right? So, um, and a lot more time if you have a slower velocity. So the way that I always look at this is that um, time, like the time of two different, um, the same gas or two different gases, time at time one and time for time two, the two different gases, 
is going to be inversely proportional to the average speed or the root mean square speed of those which is also inversely proportional to the molar masses. So the molar mass of one over the molar mass of two because these here would be inverse, right? So because time is inverse and average speed is inverse with molar mass, what we end up with is this relationship where time and molar mass are directly related, but not linear because we have that square root again, okay? So if we want to solve for time, we can do this the same way. And um, the only reason they mention in this question, we, it's, we say it takes a minute and a quarter or 1.25 minutes, not a minute and a quarter, but 1.2, I guess, and a quarter, two five minutes for 0.01 moles of helium to effuse. How long will it take for the same amount of C2H6 to effuse? All right. We don't really care about the 0.01 moles. We just need to know that it's the same amount. So we could have left this out and the question would have been the same. So I'm going to set this up um, the same exact way. So I have time one or time of helium over time of C2H6. And notice then that this is linear with the molar masses for time. So this will be the molar mass of helium over the molar mass of C2H6. And that ends up then... Um, giving me, and I should have done this the other way around, we're going to see what happens here, but what I end up with is a fraction, and so let me start over because I'll show you what happens. When I do this, I'm going to get the square root of 4 over, this is 4.00 grams per mole over um, 30.08 grams per mole, and that's going to be a fraction. So basically what I'm going to find is the fraction of the time that it would take for helium. The question is asking me about C2H6, so I'm actually going to come back and reverse this. So let's change this because that will answer my question more easily. So the time for C2H6 compared to the time for helium um, would be the molar mass of C2H6 over the molar mass of helium. And now I'm going to come over and solve it because I know that the time for C2H6 is what I'm looking for and the time for helium is 1.25 minutes and I can substitute in my molar masses and 4 for helium and now I can actually do the same thing I did before and I can um, square both sides to clear the square root which will give me um, Sorry, I don't need to do that. Oh, let me start over. I'm having a rough night, guys. So now I can do the math. I don't need to clear the square root. I can do 30 divided by 30.08 divided by 4, take the square root, and then cross multiply the 125, and I get the time for C2H6 to a fuse is going to be um, 3.43 minutes. Okay? So notice that if I wanted to just find the ratio... I could leave out the 1.25, and this part would end up being that C2H6 would be 2.74 times as long as helium, and then I can take that 2.74 times helium's 1.25 minutes if I want, and that's another way to solve it, to get that 3.43 minutes. So those are your examples to go with um, Graham's Law, to go with time, to go with different temperatures. And this is all derived from this. So notice that if anything is asking you about the speed of the particles or the rate of effusion of the particles, the only things that affect that would be temperature and molar mass. So not the pressure, not the volume, just the temperature and the molar mass. Okay? So kind of think about that. All right. So then, and you knew that already because here's the graph that you saw on the gizmo. All right, so you saw the idea of the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution and that um, the number of particles that have this average speed is this curve that flattens so that more of the particles um, here have a higher speed than they did here than they did here. Okay, so we can see how that relationship works. And so don't, oops, sorry. So don't forget that you'll be asked to interpret that. 
All right. So some quick reminders, one last bit of information here tonight, and that would be that um, reminders about kinetic molecular theory. Um, let's come back to the whole unit now and say that we know that, yes, gases are mostly empty space, and that is true. No one's going to argue about that. Even a gas that's been compressed is still a lot of empty space. Um, we're going to also say that the particles are in constant random straight line motion, and that is also true. The speed of that is affected by temperature and by molar mass, but they are definitely in constant random straight line motion. Um, there's no net loss or gain of energy during collisions, and this is something that um, in ideal gases this is true, but in real gases we have um, some things that change that a little bit. And then we talk about kinetic energy being directly proportional to Kelvin temperature, okay? So this is true. So we wanna come in and talk about how we have some comparisons. The biggest deal that happens here is that um, even though the gases are mostly empty space, we also say in ideal gases that the particle volume equals zero, okay? That the gases volume is only made of the empty space. However, that part is not true for real gases. So this is only in ideal gases that we can say that, okay? Just like only in ideal gases, the collisions um, don't gain or lose energy. So, um, so we need to talk about real versus ideal. And there are two things about real gases that affect this. The first would be that real gases have attractive forces. Um, we haven't learned IMFs this year yet. You would have learned them in your first year course a little bit, but intermolecular forces are the attractions that pull, pull, pull molecules together, and they're the reason that water is so attracted that it creates a meniscus. Um, it's attracted to the walls of the graduated cylinder as well as to itself. So those attractive forces um, in gases, we ignore them in ideal gases, but real gases actually have them. And because of attractive forces, when the particles are flying around in the container and they approach each other, they may temporarily stick together and then keep going on their merry way, right? But that little temporary attract to each other slowdown means that they're gonna hit the walls of the container less, okay? So um, what happens is that real gases, because they hit the walls of the container less, their real pressure is going to be lower than your pivnert pressure that you calculated. Okay, not significantly always, but somewhat lower. And we also have to look at the fact that gas particles do have volume. We can't compress a gas to zero volume. Once we get down so small, the particles themselves will get in the way, and the volume can only be compressed so far. So if we were really looking at the volume of the gas, we should have the volume of the particles included, but we don't in real gases. So the particle volume causes the real volume to be higher than the calculated volume that we had, okay? So you need to remember this, that attractive forces, intermolecular forces, lower the pressure of a real gas compared to an ideal, and particle volumes raise the volume over ideal, okay? Um, and we won't really don't really care about this in most cases because mostly our gases are at temperatures and pressures where they're moving so fast that the attractive forces aren't a big deal and the volumes are large enough that there's still lots of space between particles. But the things that will make a gas behave less like an ideal gas and more like a real gas are the things that would make it be a liquid. Okay, so you have two options for turning a gas into a liquid. Either you can squeeze it, squeeze it, squeeze it, squeeze it into a really small volume, which would really increase the pressure by a lot, okay? Or you can cool down the temperature. So you can drop the temperature until it condenses, all right? So, so what happens is that if you've done this and you have a really high pressure situation or a really low temperature situation, then we have to worry about the fact that that gas may not be behaving ideally, all right? So you wanna remember that gases only behave ideally at low temperatures and high pressures, or at high pressure and low temperature, they will be more real and less ideal, okay? So ideal would be high temperature to keep the particles moving fast and low pressure because that means there's lots of empty space between them, okay? Real would be high pressure and low temperature. So keep those conditions in mind. 
So I'm not, I don't want to spend long on this because you will never have to calculate it, but I want you to see that we could actually, if we wanted to, and van der Waal is the guy who dealt with intermolecular forces. Van der Waal came up with a mathematical equation. So um, let's compare one more time. Ideal gases, we say there are no intermolecular attractions. And in real gases, they have intermolecular attractions and they lower the pressure, right? So if we're going to compensate for that in calculation, we would have to add a um, situation back in to the pressure to account for the fact that the pressure is too low, all right? So in real gas situations, we do that. A is a constant. You're not worried about that value because you're not going to calculate it. Okay, but notice that um, the more gas I have, then the more attracted they would be to each other and the more I would have to add back into the pressure. But the bigger the volume is, then um, the less I would have to add back in because, of course, the bigger the volume is, the more space there is between the particles, and that means there's not as much attraction. Okay, so I just want you to kind of look at this formula as a way to think about the theory. Um, we can also do this with particle volume. Remember that I ideal gases, we say their particle volume is zero, and the only volume comes from the space between the particles. But real gases, the particle volume actually makes the volume of the gas bigger than it should be. So this equation subtracts from the volume to adjust it. Okay, so if we have um, a real gas, the number of moles would make a difference because, of course, if I have a whole lot of particles and the particle volume matters, then it's going to make my volume a whole lot bigger, right? So the moles matter, but this is another constant. So these are both constants, and you don't have to worry about them, but you should notice that we're going to, based on how many moles of gas there are, if it's in real conditions instead of ideal conditions, we may have to add back into the pressure and we may have to subtract away from the volume in order to be able to use Pivnert. You will never do the calculations unless you go on to a higher level chemistry course that deals with gases, but I need you to see the theory here so that you can understand the differences, okay? So quick reminder, remember what causes gases to behave less ideally. This can be two different things. It can be who they are or it can be the conditions that they're in. So the conditions they're in would be low temperatures or high pressures. And you can remember that this is because if you cool it down or you compress it, it is going to eventually turn into a liquid, okay? So that would be the way that you could think about that. Those intermolecular forces and particle volume have to have a big effect. Or it depends on who the gas is. So once we learn more about intermolecular forces, stronger intermolecular forces would create greater attraction and cause it to behave less ideally. All right. So that finishes off the new theory in this unit. This theory is a little bit confusing, um, maybe in both cases. So you may need to spend a little bit of time thinking your way through these notes, kind of reviewing these notes. We'll work with them together in class, but definitely um, know that this is the end. So now our task is to be able to put it all together and think our way through it, to be able to use it in the lab. So we'll do a Graham's Law lab that shows you um, how that works and um, to be able to see what's happening. So thanks for your time.